Jesus Christ, a historical figure and most certainly has shaped uh, modern society to this day when it comes to their interpretation of who God is and what righteous acts are and how to treat other people. So in today's episode, we're going to try to discover whether or not Jesus Christ actually was a man or a deity, right? The Son of God. Um, we're going to do that through a interpretation of other religions and also, of course, through the lens of the Urantia book. All right, with that said, let's get started. Despite the nature of Jesus' divinity most certainly being questioned by most non-Christian faiths, the reality that Jesus existed and had a positive impact on this planet goes beyond contestation. In Hinduism, some people believe that Jesus was an avatar of Lord Vishnu called Krishna. In Islam tradition, Jesus Christ did not die on the cross and is considered to be the second most important prophet of God, second to only Muhammad. And in the Urantia book, it states that Jesus Christ Michael, yes, the very same Michael who defeated Satan, is a child of the sacred paradise trinity with roughly 700,000 creative son family members. Whether divine or divinely inspired, let's take a look at Jesus today and which Jesus wanted to be known as, which was the son of man. According to the Urantia book, the book of Enoch was a huge inspiration for Jesus as a child, often being seen by others reading the texts. According to such texts, the Son of Man was a Messiah figure for all mankind that was named in the presence of the Lord of Spirits, a.k.a. God, a name that came before the head of days, which all came before the making of our universe. This text goes on towards describing the Son of Man as being a staff of righteous and will provide hope for those who grieve in their hearts. I personally like to take the term Son of Man a little more literally uh, through the lens of the Urantia book. In the text, it claims that Jesus Christ Michael had seven bestowal missions on their own creation planets in order to both know and be like their own creation. This assignment was not a requirement, but was conditional in order to ascertain the blessings of other divine family members and to ascertain complete uncontested authority over their own creation. The seventh and final pistol was on our planet and was to represent submitting to the will of the Father. Despite my readings in this text not offering a satisfactory explanation of what this will is, we can speculate that it correlated with some of the mandates that was presented to Christ Michael upon their reincarnation on our planet. This included the mandates of not directly revealing that Jesus was the son of the sacred trinity, contradicting the more Christian belief that Christ Michael was one of the three trinity members. Jesus also was not allowed to have children as part of this restriction, already having thousands of previous children in the form of Gabriel, which was Jesus' firstborn, who was a bright morning star to their lowest descendants, being material sons and daughters that were most representative of the Adam and Eve that we have seen in the Old Testament Bible. In fact, the Urantia book has more of a spin on the reasons for choosing our planet for their final pastoral mission, which most likely included being able to adjudicate Adam and Eve upon Christ Michael's mission termination during her last dispensation, or more commonly known as rapture period. Another stipulation Jesus was given was to not write anything down, which easily explains the over 40 years it took for the components of the New Testament to be created after Jesus' death. The Urantia book gives some credence to many of the healing miracles that Jesus had performed directly, whilst indicating to readers that the only non-healing miracle that was performed by Jesus in front of his disciples had to do with the multiplying of bread and fish during their Sermon on the Mount as more of a learning opportunity for his disciples to understand that the faithful had to find God themselves rather than being lured by parlor tricks. After all, the path to God must be chosen and not given, likely indicating why exhibiting power might lead unwilling participants to God for all the wrong reasons. 
Miracles such as turning water into wine, the voice during Jesus' baptism, and even the resurrection of Lazarus had more to do with Christ Michael's personalized thought adjuster rather than Jesus themselves, according to the Urantia text. When it comes to knowing and understanding creation, there were several instances that we can find in the Bible itself to attribute to Jesus' human fallible experiences. These include worrying both Joseph and Mary when he disappeared for several days, being in his father's house in Jerusalem. Also flipping the tables of the money handlers in front of the temple of God out of anger, cursing a fig tree for not providing fruit out of frustration, and of course the words, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me, and likely an act of despair. Exclusively in the Urantia book, we also found that Christ Michael deliberately going against Judaic traditions by creating landscapes out of potter's clay, likely hinting to Jesus' creative prerogatives. And, of course, the many Mosaic laws that Jesus violated as a man, which included not washing their hands before meals, working on the Sabbath, and declaring all foods clean, when during such times, foods such as animals with cloved feet were forbidden. Now, when I say forbidden, I meant uh, forbidden for religious practices, right? It made you unclean, um, especially eating foods such as swine. Perhaps the last human experience Jesus got to witness was being loved by not only their family members, but a woman named Rebecca who knew Christ Michael very well and wanted to marry him. The last component of Jesus' mandate to submit to our Lord's will will include being presented with an experienced thought adjuster that once served Machaventa Melzedek during the times of Abraham. For those of you that are inexperienced with the thought adjuster and what they do, let's just say that in the Rancia book, while the Holy Spirit is the mind mystery of God, the spirit of truth or Jesus' spirit is our external spiritual guide, while the thought adjuster is a spark or a piece of the Father that is a pre-personal internal guide and future part of ourselves once we complete our sending journey. As per the Urantia book, think of Melzedek as being the first order of divine sons and a starting point of understanding, which can include being a actual priest or teacher of God and can and do regularly um, get granted authority to do more than the regular mandates. The thought adjuster is a figure that indwells within us during the time of moral decision making, which is roughly around the ages of four or five years and rarely leaves their host until their life has ended. I typically view the adjuster as a shadowy snapshot of God, the Father, that, other than our experiences that go with us, go relatively unchanged throughout our lives with the sole exception of their ability to communicate with us. So whether fact or fiction, no one, absolutely no one, can contest that the Urantia book is filled with plausible possibilities. Doesn't mean it's true again. However, when it comes to the Urantia book, they give a full explanation of not only Jesus' early life, but also when it comes to their mandates, why they're here, and of course, the administration of the universe. So with that said, you know, comparing to the other religions like we had, maybe there's a lot more crossover when it comes to all world religions pointing to one singular God. So I'll leave that interpretation up to you, like always. And with that said, um, if you like today's video, please give it a like, and I will see you on the next one.